We're very honored today to have Dr. Webster join us from, Dr. from John Hopkins University. He's the director of the Hopkins Center for Gun Policy <laughs> Research and the lead editor and contributor for Reducing Gun Violence in America, Informing Policy with Evidence and Analysis. Dr. Webster is a professor of uh, health policy and management at Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health, and we're excited to hear today his talk on evidence-based approaches to reduce gun violence in America. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. It is, uh, it is truly a pleasure to be back in Ann Arbor. Um, I was here in the uh, early to mid 80s getting my MPH here, and it truly was some of the best years of my life. I, uh, I love Ann Arbor, I love the University of Michigan. I sort of found my calling in public health here, and um, I also found a bride, my, my uh, wife here as well. And um, so it's, it's really a delight to be here. Um, I am, uh, I'm going to focus, um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground here, okay? So I apologize. Uh, I won't go over it, any study in excruciating detail. What I'm trying to do is give you a big picture understanding about what do we know about the problem of gun violence and what we can do to reduce it. And my my own experience in the roughly 24 years I've been working on this problem is that unfortunately there's a really intense pessimism uh, that you can actually do something about gun violence. It seems so overwhelming to us with our problem. So I hope at the end of the day, at the end of this discussion, that you'll come away with less pessimism to feel that yes, we, there are things we can do. They're not all of them Actually, none of them are easy to do, but we can do them and, and really have a tremendous impact on public health and safety. So just briefly, just give an uh, overview of how gun violence affects uh, uh, public health and safety in the United States. Our most complete data, uh, most recent complete data, are from uh, 2011 where there were slightly more than 31,000 firearm-related deaths. Now, uh, roughly 60% of those were suicides, over 19,000, and over 11,000 were homicides. Uh, in addition to that, we have over 73,000 uh, individuals treated for gunshot wounds in uh, hospital uh, and emergency departments, um, 467, uh, 100, thousand victims of non-fatal violent crimes this is based on the uh, National Crime Victimization Survey, which I suspect probably is a, is a noteworthy undercount because uh, they do not do a particularly good job of, of uh, covering some of the most high-risk populations. Um, and uh, some, some economists have uh, estimated that the annual impact of gun violence um, the cost that we bear as a society in the United States is $174 billion every single year. Um, this is uh, homicide rates for uh, uh, high income Western democracies you can think of, uh, OECD nations. And you'll see um, we stand out quite notably here. If you would compare us to the average rate uh, for the other nations, uh, our rate of homicide is over five times high, higher, almost six times higher than the average. It might be surprising to you to know, however, that the United States, when you compare us with these same nations, um, we're not outliers. We're actually pretty average when it comes to non-firearm homicides, when it comes to rates of uh, crime in our cities. Look at our rates of mental illness, adolescent fighting, bullying, go down the list of risk factors, teen alcohol abuse, we're actually about the lowest. Um, and um, something that comes up uh, particularly in connection to, to mass shootings is um, use of violent media, uh, video games and such. We're all pretty average when it comes to that. But our rate of homicides with firearms is nearly 20 times higher than the other countries. 
Now, unfortunately, as someone who devotes uh, most of his career on this topic of gun violence and gun violence prevention, it's sad to me that about the only time that we seem to have conversations about what to do about the problem is when we have a very high profile mass shooting. Uh, these are just as some images of the mass shooting in Aurora, uh, Colorado at the movie theater. I'm sure some of these images here are also familiar to you from the tragedy at um, Newtown, Connecticut at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And so when we have these conversations, again, almost always following a mass shooting uh, of strangers in, in some sort of public space, uh, I'm sure you, you've, you've seen it, whether you're scanning through and, and uh, see something on a cable channel or read something in your newspaper, you, you see a very common debate and dialogue. And just to boil it down, one side is saying, guns don't kill, people do. And the other is saying, there's just too many darn guns. We need to get rid of guns. And of course, not surprisingly, the solutions that are put forward and derived come from our perceptions of what this problem is, that it's very heavily skewed towards these mass shootings. So if you ask Wayne LaPierre, the problem is mental illness. The problem is not enough good guys with guns. Uh, and gun-free zones. And what about how we respond to these mass shootings? Are we responding appropriately from a security and law enforcement standpoint? Um, to some degree, uh, but not in any kind of in-depth way, we also think about um, how easy is it to, for dangerous people to get guns? There's also, again, because so much of the conversation is driven by the mass shootings, a focus on assault weapons, which are very important in mass shootings, but in most other violence are pretty darn rare. Um, now, if you look at the president's uh, budget request for fiscal year 2015 and, and look for in, uh, investments in gun safety, gun violence prevention, you'll see requests for $55 million to improve um, our national instant check system, the mental health, largely the mental health records that largely are missing from, from that database. Um, again, with the underlying idea that m these mental illness, uh, mental illness and those disqualifications are a big part of our gun violence problem. They're not. They're, they're part of our suicide problem, which is important but they're not to the interpersonal violence side of things. We see 50, uh, $15 million for active shooter training for law enforcement and $75 million for comprehensive school safety, despite the fact that very, very rarely does a shooting occur in a school. And then very soon after the Newtown tragedy, the Congress asked the National Science Foundation to create a report on youth violence, and they're particularly interested in the role of violent media and uh, how to prevent shootings in schools. Now, I was a, got to participate in that task force and widen the lens a little bit, but it was very interesting how they uh, were tasked and with the focus on what I consider to be very, very small parts of a much bigger and more complex problem. Now, my discussion today is going to focus principally on, on guns, gun violence, and what we can do about them from a range of, of perspectives. But I, I want to acknowledge that while I think a big reason that explains why we are an outlier in lethal violence, while we are average in so many other forms of violence and risk factors for violence, that, that the weaknesses of our gun policy explain much of that. I also acknowledge that there are very important root causes of why we are exceptional with our murder rate that boil down to fundamental things in our economic, educational, and criminal justice policies that perpetuate inequality, really gross inequality, largely along racial lines. And this has played out in particularly strong ways and profound ways
with our approach to what we, we think of as the war on drugs. I've worked most of my career in Baltimore, and uh, it's been very frustrating to me over those years when uh, I have conversations with particularly law enforcement, and they look at the problem of violence in Baltimore, and they see it mostly through a lens of this is, this is a, a drug problem, and we're going to find the solution by addressing it in that way. And I think that's, that's led us astray. And, and oddly enough, maybe some of our best ways to reduce gun violence is through new, more innovative, and frankly, more equi equitable and humane approaches to illegal drugs. So here's, here's my path, here's my hope, frankly, my vision for how we can have dramatically lower rates of gun violence and particularly lethal violence in the United States. We do have some interventions that work on a local level that don't require some of the difficult politics that gun control has it, in it. And I'm going to talk about that. So th there are things that work, and we can and should invest on them, given the enormous social cost and magnitude of gun violence in America. We also are going to do this, we're not, not through gun bans, not through gun bans, but through approaches that focus on keeping guns out of the hands of the most dangerous people. And we're going to do this through two general ideas that I think not only are supported by data, but the underlying value is quite appealing across the board. And that is through higher standards for legal gun ownership and carrying, increased accountability of gun sellers and purchasers, and then finally, anything we're going to do in almost any sphere of American life uh, is going to involve probably new technology. It's a pretty safe bet, and I'll talk about that briefly. So, um, the uh, National Research Council convened a, a group of experts to look at the literature on gun violence and what, what we can do about it a um, little less than a decade ago. The one intervention where they felt the, the evidence was most strong and consistent in lowering gun violence were uh, specialized police units that go into what we refer to as hot spots where the most gun violence occurs to try to discourage illegal gun carrying in those settings. Um, the, the training is to look for signs that people are carrying illegal concealed guns, in some cases enforce for mi minor crimes in order to do a pat down. Uh, basically every single trial that's been done has shown significant reductions, anywhere from 29% reductions to uh, even 71% reduction in one setting in Pittsburgh associated with this approach. Now I recognize that this approach also has great potential for abuse. Um, the conversation in recent years focuses on a policy that uh, I think is most associated with the NYPD of stop and frisk. I, what this is is different from stop and frisk in important ways. Stop and frisk is, has been a, a sort of a department-wide kind of strategy, not very focused um, and, and therefore very ripe for abuses. Um, these much, much smaller units can, can be more supervised and, and disciplined so that some of the abuses don't occur. But I think studying how to do this in the right, fair way should be one of our priorities that we're largely not talking about anymore. I think just because the whole stop and frisk discussion has become kind of really red hot and nobody wants to go there. Um, but but I, I think it's worthy of discussion because in my own discussions of, of uh, community residents in Baltimore, in the areas most affected by gun violence, they don't have any problems with police looking for illegal guns. They have problems with some of the other stuff that they do in the name of 
uh, policing drugs, but uh, they're very fine with them getting guns off the street. Now there's another approach um, that has even a, a, a longer and stronger track re record of success. And that is something called a focused deterrence approach. And uh, this is something that was developed and popularized by David Kennedy. Many of you are familiar with, with his work probably and his ideas, but very basically um, you can think of this as a behavior change approach. And it uses law enforcement as a lever to change. Now, through the research, Kennedy and others have found that a really relatively small proportion of individuals in any given city are driving most of the gun violence. And applying pro appropriate leverage on those small number of actors can produce big influences, in part because they don't act alone. They act often in groups. And so if you can get them to influence not only their own behavior, but their group's behavior, you have the potential for big reductions in gun violence. So part of this is identifying that group, communicating risk to them for any acts of violence, risk in terms of uh, risk in the criminal justice system. Uh, but it's important because we've been doing that part forever, right? But how it's done and how it's communicated, it turns out, is very important. You have to communicate very directly to the individuals and frankly, do it respectfully. Um, you have to in, involve not only the guys with the badges, but the other people in their spheres that influence their behavior, who they respect. Might, might be a former coach, it might be their grandmother, it could be a variety of different individuals, but you find out who matters to those individuals and they are part of a team that all is trying to, in essence, modify behavior for less violence. Um, these individuals are also offered services. Now, the things that co most commonly come up for what these services are have to do with jobs and things. Talking to David Kennedy recently, I was very interested to know that he said quite often <laughs> the service that they provide is actually some relocation because they convince them that somebody's going to kill you doing what you're doing, and maybe you want to be someplace else. Uh, so sometimes that's actually one of the services provided. And, um, and more and more in this work, uh, doing this in a, in a fair way uh, actually matters. People want to comply with laws uh, uh, that are fair and, and uh, enforced in a fair manner. The data uh, are, have been uh, quite consistent and convincing. Uh, Meta-analysis done by uh, Anthony Braga and David Weisberg found um, in 11, 11, 11 of the 11 studies examined that the intervention group that, that got this intervention did better than comparisons. The effect size was in the immediate to large range. And in the seven of the eight interventions that focused on gangs or gun violence, um, the, uh, the effects were even somewhat larger. Interestingly, and I, I think not coincidentally, the weakest effect that they found uh, from their study was the lone um, focused deterrent strategy that was where the, what they were trying to curtail was drug selling. Now there's another approach uh, on a community level to try to, again, change behavior, to try to reduce uh, gun violence. And it's something now that's known as the Cure Violence Model. It was developed by Gary Slutkin at University of Illinois Chicago uh, as a public health approach to this pro problem. There's some similarities with uh, Kennedy's program, and it's not by accident. Uh, they also are very interested in going into <laughs> the most dangerous areas, identifying the people at greatest risk for being involved in gun violence, using some of the outreach strategies that also used in uh, focused deterrence. Importantly, <coughs> excuse me, um, much more attention is focused on, on two things. One is uh, mediating conflicts, or, or they, they refer to as interrupting violence. Um, and, and particularly those involving groups or gangs. 
as well as broader efforts to, in a, in a broader community way, try to promote uh, norms of, of not using guns to settle dispute and, and using nonviolent methods. Uh, this is a picture of a, a team working in East Baltimore, not far from my office. This little link down here, if, if people get the slides later, want to click that, it's really worth doing. It's a wonderful little 15-minute piece about uh, this gentleman, Tard Carter, a friend of mine who is really doing inspiring and great work to, to reduce gun violence in East Baltimore. So what do we know about the effects of this approach? Um, it hasn't been tried in that many cities. Uh, in Chicago, where the program was first developed and implemented, uh, an independent study found uh, evidence that it reduced violence in four of the seven communities in which they studied. In Baltimore, in an evaluation that I led, um, there were five communities that were targeted for this program. Uh, one, there was in essence an implementation failure. It never really got off the ground. So in essence, we didn't evaluate it. But it's also worth noting that it's not an easy program to, to implement. And of the four remaining sites, three of them, um, we found evidence of reducing uh, either lethal or non-lethal forms of gun violence, or sometimes both. In Crown Heights in, in New York City, uh, a recent study found that uh, some evidence of effect there, uh, a small reduction in gun violence when in a comparison area it was going up significantly. And in um, the most recent study coming from Phoenix, um, they, they found some evidence of less violence, but um, puzzlingly and concerningly actually uh, more gun violence in that area. So what I take from this from my own work and from, from work around in, in other cities is that this is a program model that can work, but it's not easy to implement. It takes a great deal to really know how to get the right people who can go in and do this work and supervise them so that they are effective in reducing gun violence. The, the one thing also worth noting is that the relationships sometimes of these program is not as, as cozy or as good as you would like with law enforcement. Some of that is because these individuals don't want, in order for them to be effective and get trust of the people they're working with, uh, they can't be seen as cozy with law enforcement. So, um, so there's challenges there, but I, I think they can actually be overcome. So I'm gonna shift now to to thinking about the supply of guns. So all the, the, the other things I just covered focus on sort of acknowledging a reality that, yeah, there are guns out there, some dangerous people are gonna get them, and what are you gonna do to try to reduce that? Now, thinking as a public health person and very much in the prevention side, I wanna think also about can we actually reduce the supply of guns to make it less likely that dangerous people have them? So in order, before I get into some of the, the data from this, I want to give you a little bit of, uh, of a background, sort of the history of gun policy in the United States for context. So in 1968, following um, assassinations of, of Robert Kennedy and, and Martin Luther King, uh, uh, we passed the gun control law of 1968. Um, basically, this created a, a framework identifying particular, particular prohibiting conditions, conditions that would disqualify you from legally possessing a firearm, and required um, anyone who was like selling guns at a retail level to have a federal license and a whole system for record keeping, including serial numbers of guns and so on. So you can think of it as sort of a foundation, minimal, minimal foundation for keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people. Um, however, I want to also mention the Firearm Owners Protection Act that was passed in 1986 that actually weakened some of those provisions in the 68 Gun Control Act, made it easier to uh, sell guns without getting a license, uh, made it harder to convict 
uh, firearm sellers when they didn't follow firearm sales uh, laws and when they did lowered the penalties for those. It also reduced the number of uh, compliance inspections that the ATF could do for licensed gun dealers and um, gave states the ability to restore the rights of felons to own guns. So this was a rolling back to some degree of what was already a pretty minimal uh, set of gun laws. Um, in 1994, we passed the uh, Brady, I think the formal name is the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. I think I got that right. Um, and basically, that required uh, background checks prior to the sale for firearms. However, those requirements for background checks were only for sales that were made by federally licensed firearm dealers. If you bought a gun from someone else, uh, it did not require such background checks or record keeping. In the late 1980s, uh, there was a period in which um, using a lot of data from crime gun trace data, it was identified a small number of gun dealers connected to a very large number of guns used in, in crime. And um, not getting into all the complexities of those, there were some, some lawsuits that were brought against the un, a gun industry. Uh, not many of them went very far. Um, but in, in, in essence, to sort of protect the industry from those potential lawsuits, in 2003, Congress passed the, what our people refer to as the TIARD amendments. Um, that limited what could be done with crime gun trace data. Uh, it would not allow the release of those data, particularly anything that says uh, how many guns a gun dealer had sold that were used in crime, and prevented the use of those data in any litigation uh, against the gun industry or even in license decisions as well. It also required uh, the information that, uh, from uh, background checks for gun sales to be uh, destroyed within 24 hours and uh, said that uh, when um, gun dealers were being audited by the ATF, they did not have to do a physical inventory. Um, uh, with even greater protections for the gun industry, in 2005, uh, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act was passed that gave a fairly broad immunity to people in the gun selling business against lawsuits. And then in, hell, uh, in 2008, Supreme Court, uh, uh, in a landmark decision, said that there was an individual right to own a firearm for self-protection in the home. Previously, uh, courts had not recognized an individual right. So that's where we are from a federal level. Um, and, but it conveniently for me as a researcher, so that I can do some, some studies, um, there's, a, there's a lot of variation from state to state. And what I spent a lot of my career doing is trying to examine that variation and see whether that makes any difference, basically. Here's just sort of a snapshot of some of the critical things that vary in how many states have these different things. Uh, so the, the, the first few rows have to do with who is prohibited from um, purchasing uh, or possessing firearms. And, um, and here's uh, what federal law says, and here's how many states plus the District of Columbia have these things. So, um, so we vary in, in how stringent our standards are for legal gun ownership quite substantially. And we also vary with respect to what I refer to as measures to, uh, of, um, to prevent diversion or, or instill accountability in a system to prevent diversions. To things like uh, regulating private sales through requiring background checks. Um, permit to purchase licensing is one vehicle in which to do this. This is a process in which if, uh, if under state law you would have to go typically to a local law enforcement to get a, a permit to purchase a, a handgun. Um, 13 states have that. Those states vary quite substantially. The most robust are in place in about seven states that require you to actually get this permit in person. Uh, sometimes you're fingerprinted by law enforcement, typically. Um, 
I also just want to note federal and state laws that relates to domestic violence. I know that's uh, understandably and importantly a, 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 an issue of concern. Under federal law, uh, there are prohibitions for convictions for domestic violence misdemeanors or if someone is currently under a restraining order for domestic violence. These are just limited to what we refer to as a final or a longer term uh, protective orders. Some states, however, uh, do cover um, temporary protective orders and uh, there's also great variability in terms of whether they cover dating partners and whether they actually require the prohibited person to surrender their firearms. So it turns out that a lot of these details uh, probably matter and that's something that April Zioli and I hope to uh, study in the near future. <clears throat> to get a, a feel for our current standards and how far they take us uh, for legal gun ownership, we looked at data from a, a, a national survey of state prison inmates of those who were incarcerated for committing crimes with firearms. And we wanted to know, looking at their backgrounds, who would be qualified or disqualified when they committed their crime. We found only 40% of these offenders were prohibited uh, under their, their state system. Uh, the most interesting piece of this, this pie chart is the red piece. And this is 29% that of a set of offenders, gun offenders, who would have been disqualified from legal gun ownership had they been in a state, in a different state, that generally had much higher standards for legal gun ownership. So this at least gives us some feel for the potential for uh, how we could uh, benefit from public safety wise for uh, higher standards. When we looked at the, into the details of, of what made up that red slice of the pie, it was overwhelmingly had to do with youthful offenders, had to do with either people who were uh, between the ages of 18 and 20 that interestingly in some places could legally possess and purchase handguns and in others not. And also um, many states disqualify uh, individuals for a period of time if they've committed serious offenses uh, adjudicated in juvenile court. The reason this matters so much is because of this age offending curve. And these numbers are too small for most of you to see, but you, you see the clear pattern of just how rapidly these risks rise in, early, in, in the late teens, excuse me. And they peak, interestingly, in 18 to 20 years old, an age group that in many states can legally possess handguns. When you get to the age of 30, the rates are much, much, much lower. So I think it's worth noting that um, all 50 states say you must be 21 in order to legally drink a beer. 21 in the District of Columbia is set 21 as a minimum age for legal handgun possession. So do these prohibition categories matter? Okay, we have a few good studies to say that they probably do, at least some of those categories. Uh, the domestic violence um, prohibitors, particularly those with um, uh, restraining orders, uh, firearm prohibitions, because that literally is the most dangerous time for a homicide, is right around the time someone is leaving a violent relationship and often getting a restraining order. Um, there have been two large studies uh, to look at this, one at the state level, one at the city level, uh, eight to 19 percent reductions in intimate partner homicide uh, with these policies. <clears throat> um, in a very different type of design, looking at more at the individual level, Garen Wintemute and his team were able to uh, look, look at the criminal backgrounds of people who were um, applied to purchase handguns legally in California just before they uh, added violent misdemeanors as a prohibitor and after, uh, after that effect and, and controlling for those background uh, levels of, of criminal offending. They found that it lowered the risk for violent crimes by 21% in the group that was newly denied by California's law. 
In, an, in a study uh, published in a chapter of our book, Reducing Gun Violence in America, Jeff Swanson and his team uh, also looked at uh, individual level data that's very hard to get your hands on to look at the disqualifiers uh, for mental illness and found when the state actually provided the data to, for that to be a meaningful disqualifier, they were able to document a significant reduction in violent offending uh, by the affected group. So, what about keeping guns from, from the bad guys? Um, how, let's start with how in the heck do they get them? Well, nearly 80%, based upon the survey from the, of, uh, that I referred to before, the state um, of state prisoners in for gun crimes, 78% um, either got them for a friend or a family member or from some sort of underground or street source. 6% um, got them through some sort of direct illegal transaction that they made with a licensed dealer. 10% um, through theft. Very few directly got them from a gun shop. So some people have used these data to say, ah, see, Gun control is kind of irrelevant to this whole discussion, right? Because they're getting in these underground markets, unregulated settings, and um, let's just forget about it. Well, we have to think carefully about where do those guns come from in that underground market, and where those guns come from from the friends and associates who they're getting their guns from. They don't sprout from the ground or drop from the sky. They're diverted from the legal market into the legal market. And they're very key channels, if you will, for these diversions. They have to do generally with unscrupulous gun dealers, licensed gun dealers, straw purchasers, those someone who is purchasing a gun on behalf of a prohibited person, and what, what generally is referred to as unlicensed sellers. These are individuals who and frankly, it's not hard to find them. If you go to gun shows, if a lot of them are just trolling around online, you'll see individuals who sell a lot of guns as private individuals. That's not technically legal. Um, but it's, Congress has made it a little bit harder to, to nail those folks down. Um, so it turns out that a relatively small number, probably less than 5%, of licensed gun dealers account for 60% of the guns used in crime. And this cannot be explained away solely by the fact that they might sell more guns, something about their client demographics that's been examined. There's still very, very gross disparities, huge outliers. We should be able to do something about, about those. So I've conducted a, a few studies that, that focus on this question. I want to talk about them briefly. So, I mentioned these lawsuits against the gun industries. The way many of these operated is they, they identified, and wasn't hard, using the gun trace data, who were these problematic dealers. They did undercover stings to see whether they made blatantly illegal sales. And when they did, they sued them, okay? We used um, gun trace data to see whether we could track using um, uh, indicators of diversion of guns, and if you want me to get in the weeds on that later, I, I can. But we found a 62% reduction in these diversion of guns from in-state dealers um, in Chicago after they did this, and in Detroit, a 36% a reduction of diversions into the criminal market shortly after a retail sale. Now, New York City went about this in a slightly different way because a lot of their suppliers were coming from out of state, but the same general idea. And there we were able to look more finely at the dealers themselves, and we found for those dealers, the, rate it, the, the probability that um, their guns that they sold would subsequently be used in crime in New York dropped by an astounding 82%. So addressing dealers matters. I'm gonna tell you other, one other quick story. This is about Badger Guns and Ammo, just outside of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Back in uh, May of 1999, ATF releases a report, shows the top 20 gun dealers in terms of number of guns they, they sell that end up in the hands of criminals. Badger is the top of that list. Within two days, those uh, owners are so embarrassed, they, they announce publicly, we're gonna make some voluntary changes in our sales practices. 
we were able to, well, we were able to, to look at what happened after they did that, but we were also able to look at what happened when the TIARD amendments came into play and you could no longer actually have the transparency to see what gun dealers like Badger were doing. And I'll show you what happened. The dark line here represents flows of guns from Badger into the hands of criminals. This is when they changed their sales policy when it was announced that they were number one in the nation. It's a 77% drop if you wonder, okay? This is when the Atiard Amendment says that you can no longer look at trace data to figure out which gun dealers are doing what. This represents a 200% increase. Now, interestingly, if you look at diversions from all other gun dealers, no significant changes here. So that what I'm saying here is that these policies are relevant to the bad actors. The other folks aren't the problem. They should be addressing the bad actors. All right. I'm going to quickly go through. Um, now, besides regulating gun dealers, we need more comprehensive measures of accountability to prevent the diversion of guns to criminals. Now, here are some of the things that we've looked at in, in a couple of studies. One study in 2009 that focused on within state diversions, so the guns weren't going across state lines. And another looked at um, guns that were traveling from one state to another. And what we found was that permit to purchase uh, systems for handguns were very protective in, in both of these studies. Um, private sales background checks also very protective in both studies. When we were able to actually get direct measures of enforcement of using the strong dealer regulations, we found a strong protective effect. We did not have that type of data, so the policies themselves without the enforcement uh, was not associated with across state border trafficking. Interestingly, mandatory theft and loss reporting requirements of gun owners to um, report loss and stolen guns also was protected, again, as accountability measure. Um, I've come to a conclusion, I don't know how scientific it is, but I actually think it is based on scientific science, that we are all biased. We're biased in, in, in what we think about how, can we actually prevent dangerous people from getting guns? And the reason we're biased is we can only see part of reality. On a daily basis, we'll see stories, mass shootings, 40 shot over a weekend in Chicago. We see it on a repeated basis, and it's burned into our brains literally. Violent people are always going to get guns. What's the point? However, we can't see non-events. We can't see when dangerous people can't or don't get guns, OK? So the only way we actually know whether this is possible is to actually do systematic studies to test it, OK? Now, that's not easy to do, but we're, we're taking a crack at it. And I'll, tell you, I'll show you a couple of uh, examples. <clears throat> Through a variety of our, our studies, we found that permit-to-purchase systems seem to be most efficacious in preventing diversions of guns to criminals for a variety of reasons. There was a big change in this policy in Missouri. Missouri, for decades, had a very strong permit to purchase law for, for handguns. If you wanted to purchase a handgun from a licensed dealer or a private seller in Missouri, you used to have to go to your local sheriff's office who would issue you a permit after a thorough background check. That permit was good for 30 days. They repealed that law on uh, August 28, 2007. And so no longer did you have to go to uh, the sheriff's office before you purchased a gun. Um, and so I suspect that, for example, if you're trying to, if you're a felon trying to recruit a straw purchaser, it was probably easier to convince them to come and do business with this guy than with this guy. That's just my hypothesis. What did we find? So using some aggregated data from gun trace data, we found, I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty of all these bars on this chart, sorry, it's 
more data that I can cover. But generally, we saw a two-fold increase in these measures of diversions, wh where very soon after a retail sale, a gun was uh, recovered from a criminal or a crime scene. Um, and it, these, these, the timing of these correlated perfectly with the repeal of this law. Similarly, we found that the share of guns recovered from criminals in Missouri uh, went up notably after this repeal compared to guns coming from other states. Now importantly, we wanted to look, what, what about homicide and murder? What happened there? Well, you'll see here the, in the, the yellow line here represents Missouri's murder rate. And uh, the, the red line is the national average. So these go in two different directions following the uh, repeal of this law. We did a very rigorous analysis of these data. I'm not going to go into all the details, but we uh, controlled for other public policies, per, uh, stand your ground, right to carry, um, Saturday night special bans, uh, looked at changes in unemployment, incarceration, rates of police, uh, poverty, all of those, all those factors. What we found is significant uh, reductions in murder associated with this law, uh, and the effects were only observable for um, homicides committed with firearms. We, <coughs> excuse me, um, we just uh, completed a new analysis looking at the effects of Connecticut's law, um, very similar type of law as Missouri repealed. Um, and we used a, a method called synthetic controls where we identified the set of state and predictors that best al allow you to track trends prior to the implementation of the law to, in order to estimate a counterfactual. So the solid line here is Connecticut and the dotted, this little line here is its synthetic control. You can see it tracks pretty well prior to this law change. But a, a few years after the law is in place, you see a huge divergence in, in uh, firearm homicide rates. This represents a 40% reduction over a 10-year period. Um, we found no change whatsoever in non-firearm homicide rates. Very briefly, just on the technology side, um, there's something called micro-snapping. I'm sure you've all watched CSI and programs like that. You know that they look at ballistic images and say, oh, this was at that crime scene and that crime scene. The problem is that that doesn't help them at all if they don't actually recover the gun. And most of the time, they don't recover the gun. What micro-snapping does is a technology that allows you to actually far more accurately discern what gun fired a particular bullet and, um, and, and uh, set up a system so that even if you didn't recover the gun, you could know who purchased that gun um, using the micro stamp technology. All right. So the way forward, I think, is we need to get away from our cultural debate, whether you like guns, you don't like guns, quit talking about bans, and focus on keeping guns from dangerous people using high standards and accountability. We need to cultivate gun owners and par as part of this, 70 to 80 percent of them support a broad range of policies um, that are directed towards keeping guns from dangerous people. Interestingly, on most of those, there's no statistical difference between gun owners and non-gun non owners in their support for these policies. And we need to perhaps simultaneously say that the NRA represents not so well what gun owners actually want, but probably more what a pretty extreme version of gun owners and the industry want. If you think we can't do this, think about how far we've come on drugs. It used to be political suicide to be anything but tough on drug offenders. Now we have Cory Booker and um, Senator Paul in agreement that we need to reform our gun laws, or drug laws, excuse me. So I will end there and we'll take some questions. So the question was, um, 
noting how prominent family and friends are as sources of guns for, that criminals use, what can we do on the accountability side to address that? Uh, most squarely what we can do to address that is have comprehensive background check systems. Because right now, if, if let's just say I have a friend who's a felon and, and I buy a gun, well in Maryland my laws are different, but in some states I can purchase a gun, I can then sell, loan, trade, whatever with this felon and because there's no requirement on me to keep records, to do background checks, to do anything, um, that's a really easy thing to do. It's a low risk thing. It's, all, it's very, very difficult for me to help be held accountable without a background check requirement because I didn't have to. I just said, I don't know, I sold it to some guy. You know, I, I, I saw him at a gun show or I, whatever. Uh, he, we started talking guns and I, I made the sale in the story. Uh, there's no requirement. So individuals need to understand that they're purchasing a gun and it's for them and they are accountable, should be accountable for that gun. And if they're going to transfer it, you do it in a lawful way to make sure that it is not a prohibited person. So, so the first question was, what do we know about open carry of firearms and crime? So that's an easy one. We know zip. <laughs> I don't think it's been systematically studied. My own sense is that it's not a huge issue. I think, I, to me, it is, it is a part of a whole cultural battle, a cultural battleground that I personally am trying to disengage from. I don't think it's all that productive. Um, I mean, I understand why in certain contexts open carry is scary, it's offensive, it's maybe a bunch of things, but um, it it's kind of gets to this divide that I think is very difficult to get at. What I think is going to be more productive is focus on where is their agreement on something that would matter. Let's, let's say you turned a switch and open carry went away, I suspect our violence wouldn't change at all. Okay. So the other question I had to do, what do we know about data on defensive gun use? Um, my personal opinion, and I think the opinion of many people who study this phenomenon, is that we really don't have reliable data. It, it turns out it's a very, very difficult thing to gather data on because, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of reasons and it, it might be a, a, a bit of a long answer, but um, there, we, we, we People on different sides of this debate sort of caricaturize what this defensive gun looks like, okay, gun use looks like. And what it looks like in this characterized way is there's some bad guy in the shadows, it's a stranger, you pull out your gun and you know, you either he goes away or you shoot him or whatever, okay. But the reality is that yes, sometimes that will happen, but Far, far, far more commonly, there are altercations between individuals in which one or more parties has a gun. And who is the aggressor and who is the victim side of that depends on your perspective. So if you would ask, do a survey, of, <laughs> do your, your survey of the people involved in that altercation, one would say, both would probably say, I was the victim, he was the aggressor. And when, when people have attempted to measure defensive gun use and we've sort of taken the, that data and tried to extrapolate to the population to, for some kind of reality taste, test with actual real measures, we find nothing comes even remotely close to reality. To me, again, I got better things to do than think about how we measure. I, I personally am convinced that we're not going to measure it very well. Yes. So, so the question was, why do I think uh, so much energy and focus goes towards uh, very divisive issues on cultural lines like assault weapons? I think there's probably a number of answers to that, or a number of reasons why. One is, as I indicated earlier in the talk, assault weapons are very prominent in mass shootings, and mass shootings dominate our conversations and debates among gun policy. The individuals most engaged in making the law, law stronger quite often are people who are victims of those mass shootings or their families. And so it's very understandable why 
they say, this is ridiculous. Why should we have those kind of weapons around? I also think it's, it, it, it's something, um, the, the core, the, the people who feel most strongly about this issue, they probably want to have a cultural debate. <laughs> and they really, really don't like certain guns. And so, so I think that's part of it. But I, I sort of think that it is, um, while I can say there's a very rational reason for why you might want to have certain regulations or restrictions as it relates mostly with as it relates to uh, ammunition capacity um, but it so polarizes and makes it difficult to do probably far far more important things um, and so the, the things that we've spent most of our time on with concealed carry and um, and assault weapons aren't nearly as important. I mean, they're not unimportant, but not nearly as important with what I, what I think is a core issue, which is how do we set up laws that set up reasonable standards for gun ownership and keeping guns from those who shouldn't have them? Yes. Yeah. So, so the question was whether, uh, given how prominent gun suicides are in the United States as, as a cause of death, far more so than, than gun homicides, what about these policies and their impacts on, on, on suicides? Hasn't been studied nearly as well. Um, there's some evidence that the most comprehensive laws have some um, beneficial effect in reducing suicides. I think the, the uh, I've also published a study that looked at the laws that require gun owners to store their guns locked up and away from underage youth. And we, we did find a um, nearly a 10% reduction in adolescent suicide connected with those kind of laws. Um, but it hasn't been studied all that well. There's a little more weapon substitution going on there. Uh, so some of the beneficial effects get washed away from we weapon substitution. I think that is less so for the youthful suicides that are tend to be, oops, uh, far more impulsive. So if you can prevent uh, access to the most lethal means uh, for a young person uh, who, who might have suicidal thoughts, uh, that's a life-saving thing. So, so the question, uh, is it true that gun deaths are gradually going down in the United States? Uh, yes, they have. Uh, we had our biggest change in, in um, gun homicide rates in the uh, latter part of the 1990s. Much of the time since then has been relatively flat, but with a slight downward trend, which is encouraging. Um, so we have had far, far higher homicide rates. We can lower them. Um, so I, I, I think, I, I think uh, again, getting back to this sort of inherent pessimism, there, there are things that, that, that can work, that you can do and can lower uh, both gun homicide and suicide, and um, we need to implement more, and we need to study more so that we, we know how to be most effective. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. So the question uh, was, what do we know more about these focused deterrence strategies as far as do they have lasting impact, in essence, and, and for how big of an area? And so, um, so many of the studies... Um, you know, don't look real long term. Might look at a year, two years, maybe three. Three years, I think, is probably tops. Um, so, however, you know, I think anything that's going to really work on a problem like gun violence and gun, gun homicide, uh, we can't expect that it's going to be easy, that we just put something in place, talk to some offenders, and then you're, you're good you know, and, and we've done it. Uh, whether it's passing laws and enforcing them the right way, whether it's implementing uh, focused deterrence or the cure violence strategy, how you actually implement matters a lot in, in what the ultimate results are. So uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't think that we, this is free. You know, we can just, you know, do it and it'll go down for a, a long time. I do think that the, the laws, uh, one reason why I focus on the laws is because of, I think they will have lasting impact. But again, I think enforcement is important.
Well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. Thank you for your attention.